Tonight I wanna see the bright lights over me Show me something magical, something beautiful Come and take me higher, set my world on fire tonight Tonight Show me everything I want to know You take me right around the world The feeling tonight, got me feeling so right Let's have a good life This edition of Top Billing was made to celebrate the 93rd birthday of Nelson Holisasa Mandela on the 18th of July 2011. This is the show he watched. From the first home he owned here in Vilagazi Street, we saddled up with the bikers for Mandela Day. Ahmed Katrada took us to Robin Island. Chef Anna Trapido wrote his autobiography in food. Photographer Bonile Bam traced his roots. Sonu Avile Ndamase shared the story of the Madiba shirt. And Zelda Lekhranje, Oprah, F.W. de Klerk, Tokyo Sehwale, President Jacob Zuma, and Grasa Michelle Mandela described the man they knew and loved. Who knew on the 18th of July 1918, as the First World War raged, that here in the village of Mvezo, one of history's most potent peacemakers would be born. Somehow his father knew and named him Holi Hlatla, which suggests one who pulls the branch of a tree. The full meaning of that name, however, would only be understood in a place a world away from here. Fellow Rivonia trialist Ahmed Katrada shared the same sentence as Madiba and spent almost two decades here on Robin Island. Tell me about when you first arrived here, what were you faced with? Well, the first thing we had to do on that cold winter's rainy day was to change into prison clothes. All my colleagues, my seniors, my leaders, the regulation said they must have short trousers no socks, right through the winter. I, being an Indian, given long trousers. The policy was meant to belittle black African prisoners as boys who wore shorts and no socks except when there were camera crews on site. Small privileges were afforded but to colored and Indian prisoners. So when it came to food, I got caught a loaf of bread every day, but they were no bread. For 10 years, African prisoners did not get bread. After an eight-month trial, this was their stark reality. The defendants had made a collective decision. It was a political trial. And as leaders, they took the opportunity of the court proceedings to make their organization's political beliefs public. Soon after we arrived here, Madiba, on behalf of the leadership, said, comrades, we are no longer leaders. Our leaders are outside of, in Lusaka. We are ordinary prisoners like you people. And we don't want any exemption. Around the upheaval of the 76 uprising and heightened world pressure, the state was forced to invite a press tour to make prison conditions appear less severe than they actually were. You will notice that the group here have got hammers and this group here has got no hammers. So on one day, they gave us light uh, prison labor jerseys to mend. We did not know what was happening. Once the press were off the island, it was back to hammers. The sustained hard labor on the quarry caused long-term damage to Madiba's eyesight. And yet, in an unexpected way, it opened all their eyes to the opportunities they had in each other's company. Your time at the Lime Quarry was meant to physically and psychologically really break you. Talk me through that time. None of us had done pick and shovel work before. So each day you have blisters and bleeding hands. But it was an advantage. When we had smuggled news, that was the time to go from group to group to tell them. The shared knowledge of highly educated inmates turned the island into an unofficial university. 
Ahmed converted his imprisonment into a staggering four official degrees. Madiba was steadily shaping the learning, insight and resolve that would make him such a fine leader and doing so from these five square bare meters. This is Madiba's cell. This is where he spent 18 years. In addition to what uh, you see here, what is not here, is a bookcase and a little table and a bench. For 14 years, there were no beds. This was our bed, a size of a mat, a felt mat. There were no flush toilets. So this was the toilet bucket. It had to be, it had to be emptied every morning. What went through your mind to have to live here for 10, 14 years in this particular section? Prison is also a state of mind for political prisoners. Life meant life. The first thing you have to do is to stamp your dignity as human beings. You got to change the environment to make it less intolerable. How do you change the environment like this? You have to accept the fact there is no escaping. But you don't even have a concept of, of time, of what month it is. Of, how, how did you all manage to, to navigate a sense of reality, a normality about just the world out there? You know, some of the things you've got to accept. Uh -huh. You keep on demanding better conditions. There were improvements. Mm -hmm. In the three years' time, everybody got the same clothing. This is the triumphant of a human spirit. In 1951, Ahmed had visited Auschwitz concentration camp and had been deeply affected. Thirteen years later, he entered another kind of hell. The sound of the key as you turned to open the door sent chills down my spine. Uh -huh. What did that do to you? Well, you get used to that. Of course, it's a very important thing. You, you, you raise this point. The, the key is, is a very important uh, thing. I mean, that's taken away your freedom and separated you from your near and dear ones, separated you from the outside world. This key. 2011 marked the 20th anniversary of the key's opening for the last political prisoners on Robin Island. For a country which today boasts such a humane, fair and noble constitution, this concrete and iron monument is a poignant reminder. Next, we saddled up for 67 minutes with the bikers for Mandela Day, and Chef Anna Trapido documented his hunger for freedom. It was here in the grazing fields of Kunu that as a five-year-old herd boy, young Holi Tlatla grew up fast. As a man, he'd often remember the idea that a leader is like a shepherd, letting the most nimble go on ahead and the others follow, none realizing all along that they were being directed from behind. His ideas continue to sparse on. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. That was one of Madiba's sayings which made bikers and all of us identify so closely with him. He spent more than 67 years of his life uh, giving of himself to us for this country that we have today. And we're saying minimally you can give 67 minutes. We're not demanding that you give like your whole life like Madiba did but you can just give us 67 minutes of your time minimally. They call themselves bikers for Mandela Day and among their number doing daily reports from the road for the 2011 trip was DJ Fresh. I love bikes, I love giving and if you can combine the two then why the heck not? There for the send-off was Madiba's most personal envoy, Grasser Michelle Mandela, who would also catch up by helicopter at one of the projects on their tour. Then there were those who insisted on going by road. It really is such a pleasure to be in this group of, of people, this bunch of riders who have uh, such a great sense of responsibility for 
the people around them and this is how we serve the spirit of Mandela Day. I'm a biking enthusiast so as soon as I hear biking and then someone says it's eight days across South Africa I'm like epic adventure and we get to do charity where do I sign in as well. <laughs> The 2011 route took them to orphanages, soup kitchens and schools from the Free State through KZN and Mpumalanga, starting at a home for children run by the Reverend Wendy Duval. Wendy, Hope House is quite unique in that it's a safe haven for abandoned and abused kids. There was nothing of its kind in the Eastern Free State. And one of the ladies in town got passionate about children who'd been abandoned. Her house filled up eventually. She had about 14 kids. And then some of the pastors and ministers got involved, started an umbrella body called Tswaranang Community Centre. And this old building, which was a railway hostel, was cleaned up. And the various business people and churches got involved and turned it into a home for the children. Internationally, in 2009, Mandela Day was approved as a UN Day of Humanitarian Action in celebration of the life and legacy of the great man. The clock is ticking. We literally have 67 minutes. Everybody's so busy. There's so much excitement. I absolutely love it. Madiba said, I'm not a saint unless you think of a saint as a sinner who keeps on trying. And everyone taking part was trying to make a difference. So, concert. apparently this is your first time painting. Is this true? No, that's not true. I actually had to paint for food in the United States of America traveling when I was young. But it was a lot easier than this. But it was never 67 minutes, right? No, no. It took us 67 days to paint a wall. <laughs> Let there be justice for all. Let there be peace for all. Let there be work, bread, water and salt for all. The motivation was in his words. We want to show the, how big is the difference you can make in 67 minutes so that people can find it easy to follow our example. Um, so that's why we really only here for 67 minutes. <laughs> Actors, DJs, reality TV contestants and musicians may not be known for their DIY skills, but they brought inspiration. And what does it mean for you? When you start helping other people, you, you get so much back for it and uh, um, that's why I'm part of this. I just decided now I think I'm going to put some racing stripes on the slide, so it's, we're going to call it Pump My Slide. <laughs> This literal brightening up of people's lives was an expression of what Madiba did with his freedom. Then there was the historical side, upgrading the site in Howick where he was arrested. Love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. The significance is that this is uh, the, we are almost at the 49th anniversary of Madiba's capture here. So the, 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 the significance that we say Bikers for Mandela Day is not about celebrity um, like, like we've been trying to emphasize and it's also not about the 67 minutes only. It's taking us back to significant sites of the life and times of Nelson Mandela and this is one of those. There was no roadblock this time but there were several bikers trading leathers for gardening gloves and strelitzias with Heike Berg calling the shots. Just to be part of this whole crowd, doing it for Mandela and being part of this initiative, it's, it's awesome. It's what an experience. And the, the people that we meet, and, and everybody's in good spirits. Everybody's in good spirits. Everybody's willing to help. We use the 67 minutes. Um, I mean, I'm delegating. That's what I'm doing. The dispatches from the road proved a hit with radio audiences. And this simple decision to head out and do good triggered a sometimes neglected human impulse. Generally, I think we are wired to give, but we become selfish because life takes over. And you know, once in a while, you know, if you slow down, you know, pull that handbrake and make it about someone else, then flip, yeah, then we're all winning. It is as easy as, um, you know, just organizing a group of friends, going somewhere where you see there's improvement needed, and do something. It's as easy as that, and it's uh, what Alfie Cox called it earlier, it's networking. We all know someone that can help someone. If we can't do it ourselves, organize them to do something. And we hope that's the impact that Mandela Day will have on the entire country, but all, all over the world as well. Someone suggested that Madiba had influenced infinity, and nobody knows where that ends. Let there be work, 
bread, water and salt for all, said Madiba, and the liberty to enjoy us all. That's the chance he gave us. Anna Trapido is the author of Hunger for Freedom, the story of food and the life of Nelson Mandela. She'd cooked for him, and here's what she learned about the great man from his appetite. This slice of Madiba's wonderful life was dedicated to food, and being recorded for his birthday, it was full of anecdotes that were intended to tickle his funny bone. It's not just a cookbook, there's more to it, right? It's really a gastro-political biography, so it's a biography told through food. So at every significant stage in Madiba's life, what I've done is work out what was on the dinner table. The freedom he and his fellow political prisoners helped win was of course also the freedom to eat anything under the sun, which wasn't necessarily on a five-star menu. Given that Nelson Mandela was alive when Anna shared these fond memories of the powerful leader, she recalled a story guaranteed to raise a smile when Madiba himself heard it. You know, if Madiba had to pick one thing to eat for the rest of his life and not eat anything else, I know what he'd pick. He'd pick a masi, that this is a taste that he has loved since he was a little boy. It's just, it is completely central to who he is. We just think, ah, it's just sour milk. But what it actually is, is it is the great fresh cheese of Southern Africa. There's an interesting story in the book about the Dorchester. When he was the president, Madiba uh, went on a long trip that started in France and then um, ended in England. So he'd been away for a couple of weeks at this point. Well, at least where Madiba's chef got a phone call from Zelda, who was with him, saying, Madiba is sick of the food. You need to send us some Amasi. Now, it is profoundly illegal to carry raw milk <laughs> cheese across national borders. So um, a lady called Vimla Naidu uh, walked across um, customs with this thing and Zelda said, if you get stopped you are to phone me immediately because I will phone Tony Blair because Madiba says he's going home if we don't get this mask. <laughs> so that's how Madiba got his mask at the Dorchester. From boyhood to marriage, activism, imprisonment to presidency, the biography is told in sandwiches, sugar, samosas and curry, a language we all understand. I am such a curry man, but how did this crab curry make it into the book? When Madiba was a very young man, he was a youth league activist. He was delivering pamphlets with a man called Roy Naidu and they got arrested and they spent a day and a half in jail and they were released and his buddy Roy said, come to my house for supper. He looked in the pot and he thought, I've never seen that animal and I don't know these smells and I'm not sure I like this food. And, but you know, because he has lovely manners and you know, he thought, I've got to eat this. <laughs> and he sat down and he ate the curry that Mrs. Naidu had made. And he discovered that not only did he love crab, um, which he'd been so frightened of, but that he loved curry. What has writing this book taught you about Madiba? What I got out of it was really a sense of the man behind the legend, you know, that, that it's very easy to deify Nelson Mandela, and, but I think that doesn't do him any favors, that if he's a god and not a man, we can't emulate a god, that's an impossible act, but the man who missed his wife's spaghetti and mints, who longed to sit at the table uh, with his little girls, who really enjoyed being at a braai with George Bezos, you know, that man, that's a person that, that we can emulate. The greatest value of each recipe is that each time Anna or anyone else cooks one of these dishes, Madiba and his delicious sense of humor will be remembered as if he himself were still present at the table. Next up, photographer Bonnie Leibam traces Madiba's roots and meet the creator of the Madiba shirt, Sonwa Bile Ndamasi. Anna Trapido is absolutely right. Nelson Mandela was always one of us. When he was much younger, he'd slide down this very rock along with the other kids in the area. Brave fun. That he grew up to be great wasn't by chance, but through a series of brave choices he made throughout his life. Photographer Bonnie Le Baum takes a look at the proving ground Madiba had to go through just like all of us. One where he was first just a child 
Then, just a man with choices. Madiba had Khoisan ancestry but was most associated with Xhosa traditions. Growing up in PE's Gwazekele township, Bonile Bam shares this Eastern Cape heritage. Given a life-changing opportunity, he changed his destiny. Uh, when I was uh, 15 years old, this guy asked me to photograph him together with his girlfriend and the guy said, Bonile, you can now have this camera. It's yours forever. And um, that was the turning point of my life. Bonile went on to seek internships at newspapers, worked as a photographer, studied in New York, and became a respected photojournalist whose work did not go unnoticed. I was working for a weekend newspaper in Johannesburg. I received a call from the Nelson Mandela Foundation. I was requested to photograph Madiba privately whilst he was meeting like uh, some of, of the guests. And he said, you must treat a camera like a key. It will unlock many doors for you. Since the work was shown at the foundation, there's been so many people who visited and I heard that he liked the work. Before the student activist, before the lawyer who'd defend himself in court, before life imprisonment, Kodesa and becoming our first democratically elected president, there was another Nelson Mandela Bonile identified with. Madiba is respected around the world and people don't know that he's coming from an ordinary background. And my view was to give an insight of who is this person and where he comes from. He's coming from like a humble background like myself and every young boy from the township or from the village. So I wanted to share that about Madiba's life coming from just an ordinary background. Bonila's work draws from that rich Eastern Cape heritage and he also puts back into it with community photographic workshops to offer the same chance at life which he was afforded. Through traveling around the villages, I've learned to witness the stories that Madiba was sharing about being able to support each other, those values of respect, you know, tradition and part of culture. Uh, has helped me also to learn about life in general. And uh, to me, it's really an inspiration to know that Madiba still remembers where he used to play as a young boy, and still he can be happy to see a reflection of the places he used to visit since he was young. A respected media professional whose work more than earns him the title of photographic artist, Monile Bam's biggest breakthrough was understanding the responsibility that came with his opportunities. He knows who taught him that. As a child, a young Nelson Mandela feasted on life, swimming in cold, clear streams and fishing with twine and bits of sharpened wire. Later, he'd say, we ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, handsome, talented and fabulous? Actually, who am I not to be? Well, nothing shouts that spirit at the world quite like the fabulous Madiba shirt. Like his great muse, Sonwabile Ndamase never took the easy path and his decision to go into fashion enjoyed no support from his royal Pondo family who saw it as a woman's trade. His choice to study African design brought him in contact with the Mandelas. You're the designer of the world famous Madiba shirts. How did that come about? Well, it started with the family actually when I was involved with um, Mama Winnie and together with Zinzi. The old man started to say, Oh, are you the designer? <laughs> Typical of Mpondo. And then when I started to speak to him, I said, and then he started to ask me, What can you do for me? And then the following day, he told me that. Uh, you have to understand that I don't want your dashi shirts. I don't want to dress like this, I don't want to be like this, and then this is exactly what I would like to see happening. I want something that is more comfortable that I'll be wearing thereafter. Was there any particular reason why you designed a shirt as opposed to a suit? He had this 
itinerary and then he didn't want to carry anything that is too heavy. And then he says, okay, fine, I need something that whenever then I come out, to, out of a formal meeting and then I could go out there and then the, the crowd must not look at me as this kind of a person that is not connecting with them. With them. And then that was what I had to do. So what did Madiba's friends and family say when they saw your creations for the first time? Mama Winnie then, when I was giving the shirt back, Mama says, how and why are you giving? Tata, you know, the Captain fabric. <laughs> Curtains. So in his 70s, Madiba was making groundbreaking statements on style. How do you feel? I'm comfortable, you know what I mean? That's the whole thing. It's comfort. You must understand the trick with Madiba shirt. It is about comfort because you have to own the feeling. You have, therefore, to transmit it as in terms of how people look at you. Because why? You are comfortable. Don't wear things for the sake of wearing them. Wear them because they give you comfort. That's exactly, that's a trick. I think I can feel the Madiba magic already. You go, man. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> <Anyway. laughs> Taking a leaf from his great client's book, Sonwabile's social involvement also involves helping thousands of school children with uniforms. What has the Madiba shirt done in terms of boosting Afro pride? A statesman of that caliber wearing Afrocentric shirts, it has actually helped us as African people to identify who we are, where we are coming from. And that's what he has done to make us the happy people of Africa. Spreading that happiness, Sonu Abile designed shirts for the 2011 Rugby World Cup. And even without the 1995 win Madiba helped his side to, the stylish appeal was alluring. On the day of his release in 1990, Nelson Mandela said, I stand here before you not as a prophet, but as a humble servant of you, the people. Your tireless and heroic sacrifices have made it possible for me to be here today. I therefore place the remaining years of my life in your hands. Still to come, some of the key people who so carefully held his life in their hands. Here at the remnants of the school where the seven-year-old Holly Hlatla first got his English name Nelson from one of his teachers, we're reminded of the words, a good head and a good heart make a formidable combination. But when you add to those a literate tongue or pen, then you have something very special. Nelson Mandela learned this early in his life and he never stopped learning. Along the way, he taught a good few things to some other notable people who walked beside him. After the unbanning of the ANC in February 1990, a first key group of the movement's leaders returned to South Africa to begin negotiations that would lead to democratic elections. Among them, a man who would help bring peace to the factional violence in KZN and who would follow in Madiba's footsteps. Mr. President, Tatu Madiba has influenced many of us. How has his leadership influenced you after his release and during your presidency? President Mandela was one of the very dynamic leaders. He was this leader who was not just talking and just uh, being reasonable. Uh, he was there, very brave, ready to take action. So as we began the of negotiations, the he led us. We were a team Hi. behind him. What a wonderful experience. It must have been extraordinary. Absolutely. The manner in which he puts across his views, at times I used to pity. <clears throat> F.W. de Klerk. Nobody will ever forget the period when Matiba preached reconciliation. What should we be doing to make sure that we maintain that legacy of a great leader? I think it is important when we are faced with situations always to remember that, by the way, our leaders, Walter Sisulu, Oliver Tamar, Matiba, would not have done it this way. I think we should always remember what they stood for, what they said as a nation, and we must be ready to learn continuously from their wisdom. Like Mandela, his opposite number in the National Party knew how to play a long game. F.W. de Klerk took the bold steps his predecessors had dismissed or merely flirted with, and in his ANC counterpart, he found an extraordinarily gracious partner. 
you had the rare opportunity and indeed an honor to be able to release Nelson Mandela in 1990. Let's talk about that. After I made the speech on the 2nd of February 1990, he was brought to my office. And I said, Mr. Mandela, I want you to be the first to know you will be released on the 11th of February. And Madiba said, no, no, sir, it's too soon. And I remember saying to him, Mr. Mandela, you and I are going to negotiate about many things, but you've been long enough in jail. Let's negotiate about where do you want to be released and what time of the day. And he smiled and accepted. The transition was a very peaceful one when everybody said we're going to have a civil war on our hands. How did you go about that? His absolute viewpoint that South Africa is for all, that there should not be an approach of retribution, that we should work together and that in the new South Africa there should be good relations between all ethnic groups in South Africa. That leadership that he has shown, I think, was a crucial factor. The 1995 World Cup rugby was a turning point for our nation. What do you think that did for us? He donned the number six jersey with the springbok here, walked onto the field. The psychological effect of bringing people together of that occasion, I think, can never be overestimated. Both your Madiba and Nobel Peace Prize winners, how can we as a new generation able to uphold what you have achieved? His vision for the future of South Africa is contained in that constitution. And if we talk now on his 93rd birthday of honoring his legacy, we must realize that if we dishonor the constitution, we dishonor Nelson Mandela's legacy. Tokyo Sehwale was first-hand witness to that calm wisdom which kept the nation on course to stability and opportunity. When F.W. de Klerk, Tokyo Sehwale and President Jacob Zuma spoke to top billing, Madiba was still very much with us and you could feel the force of his personality alive in their words of praise. Mr. Mandela has many redeeming qualities. What do you think are his most striking? I would like to learn from him humility. But humility must not be seen as sitting back. Madiba is a fighter. Remember, this is a heavyweight boxer. In his life, two-tone shoes and, and, and those type of things, lions on his head. Uh, Madiba was the founder of an army. You want to have that humility, but also that which I admire most in him. It is the power of courage to stand for your position and let, not let things go wrong in your presence and no underdog must suffer whilst we are there. That's Nelson Mandela. He has been called so many things, leader, activist, soldier. At the end of the day, he is a man, a very well-loved man. More than any other thing, he is, he is the custodian of the ethics, the values, the principles, the moralities, the good things that we should be aspiring to. The message is that it's now in your hands. Madiba is done, Madiba is done. We just have to carry on the struggle for good, for peace, for friendship. Former Miss South Africa Nonchantla Peggy Sue Kamalo received one of Madiba's greatest gifts, an education. The daughter of a domestic worker, when she won her title and was invited to meet the president, he asked how he might help. She wished to study at university. He made it happen in Manchester, England, where she graduated with an MSc in economics. This was a scholarship that came from somebody who was very special, not only to myself, but somebody who was very passionate about education. I think, you know, there's a quote uh, on education that um, where he says, we need to make every home, every shack, every place a center of learning, you know, and, 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 and that's how passionate he is about education. And I thought to myself, I cannot fail him. You know, um, he's not doing this for me, he's doing it for many others. He always takes the time to do the little, and that's one of the things that I absolutely admire about him. Yeah, definitely. I mean, even when he comes into a room, he starts with 
the workers. You know, if there are people, whether it's waitresses or, you know, that that's where he's going to start greeting and interacting before he meets with the presidents and the queens and, you know, and that for me is a special, it's a special skill, you know. Um, so he relates to everybody. It doesn't matter what your status is, as long as you're a human being, that will hold you in high regard. From the children he was always such a natural with to world leaders, everyone got the respect of Nelson Mandela, a shining example of what we can all still aspire to. Next, a touching and moving insight as two powerful women, Oprah and his beloved wife, Grassa Michelle Mandela, told us how they loved and admired him in our July 2011 birthday tribute to Nelson Mandela. Where do we start counting Nelson Mandela's value to us and in what currency? Perhaps it's in the wealth of self-worth and self-belief he's given us as individuals, as a nation and as a continent. But as Grasa Michelle and Oprah Winfrey suggest, that wealth only has value to those who use it. Nelson Mandela secured South Africa's future by making partners of former enemies. And so the world came calling for inspiration on helping the Irish, Israelis, Palestinians and other African countries to also see their way past partisan thinking to political solutions. The world statesman had been born, though his friends always knew the human being behind the legend. Now there's a story about Madiba's hair oil. He's not a saint, he himself so, he's not a saint, he's got human weaknesses, one of which was vanity. So he was used to a hair oil called Pantene. And uh, when his supply finished, he ordered more, and they said that it's not available anymore. He spoke to the commissioner of prisons when he came from Pretoria, he spoke to Helen Susman when she visited us. These people don't want to get my Pantene. So the prison authorities then ordered, please go to every shop you can and get Pantene. So he got hold of a few, but it didn't, it didn't end there. On his 80th birthday, this article of mine appeared the day before. Mm -hmm. And uh, by that time, we managed to get hold of two bottles of Pantene <laughs> from America. So he came out and there he sees the whole media with this water brunt, with a big board, Happy birthday, and the two bottles of plenty. <laughs> to Oprah, whose country lost their own Madiba in Martin Luther King Jr., the Mandela leadership and tireless giving of self found its highest expression in his abiding love of children, one she clearly shares. How important is gratitude and service to you? Here, obviously, in South Africa, where would this country be without Nelson Mandela and all of those who were imprisoned with him, before him, and after him, uh, Nelson Mandela. So there are, there's a bridge to now for us. And so um, for me, the recognition that there are those who've come before, but that also Dr. King had said that not everybody can be famous, but everybody can be great because greatness is determined by service. That's my favorite quote of all time. And Nelson Mandela's service to his country was part of his greatness that inspired people like Oprah to retrace their African roots. South Africa has a, has a, it's a, it's a deep-rooted uh, spiritual connection I cannot explain. And so I'm committed. I mean, from the first time I landed here, and by God, you spend, you know, I spent 10 days at Madiba's house eating his food and sitting at his table and being able to listen to his words and his wisdom and to that. I've been very blessed. So how, how, how can you not? How can you not? How can you not? And once you've seen it, once you've seen where there is a need for your service, you cannot pretend that you didn't see it. His greatest reward for a life of service was surely Grasa Michelle Mandela. For the 93rd birthday celebration, she shared the joy of their relationship. The Mediba magic, how has that impacted your life? You know, uh, there is the magic for the world and there's the, the magic between the two of us. 
it's uh, when you, you 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 fall in love it's it's it it changes you isn't it you just feel like you 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 are you are ready to 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 give and to receive in a very very special way so the magic for me it's uh, it's that very personal it's not the magic of what other people think of Matiba. It's completely different. And I must say, I find it a bit difficult to talk of him because we are so close. I don't have the distance, which other people do. So how it has impacted my life? I would say it made me more... More humane. Wow, wow. Yeah. That's really profound. And every time I see you and Papa together, it is such a match made in heaven. You take care of him and the way you are just always fully present. I think we met also in the best of times, if you like, because uh, uh, Madiba was uh, about to, to, to live public life. Uh, I continue to do my work, but I can choose always occasions where I am at home or I'm away. So we, we are blessed that uh, uh, our love story is, is folding in a, in a time where we can make millions of choices of how we spend time together. The second reason is that, uh, yes, of course, you know, with the, with, the, with the difference of age between the two of us, I am conscious that uh, I have to take care of Madiba in all single small things to make sure that uh, he is healthy, he is comfortable, he is happy, and he has the best of environment for him to really, after the kind of life he had, now it is his opportunity to, to enjoy himself, to enjoy the company of his family, the company of his friends, and it, as he said sometimes, to sit down and reflect as he says. So it is, it is clear to me that uh, uh, if there is anything I can do, it's, it's, it's make him happy. That joy together with her love and care and the affection and caring of all those around him undoubtedly extended his years. He celebrated every new candle. I, uh, I'm happy that uh, I've lived until now. Because uh, there are not many people who look after themselves and uh, who can live for such a long time. And I'm happy that uh, I'm still alive. Dato, your family is very important to you. Do you regret not having had more time with them? I don't regret it because the things that attracted me were things that pleased my soul. So I don't regret it. It always seems impossible until it's done, he said. Of others, we expect the best. Of Nelson Khorihlatla Mandela, we expected the impossible. He gave it and he continues to give it. I've walked that long road to freedom. I've tried not to falter. I've made missteps along the way, but I've discovered the secret that after climbing a great hill, one only finds there are many more hills to climb. I've taken a moment here to rest, to steal a view of the glorious vista that surrounds me, to look back on the distance I've come. But I can only rest for a moment, for with freedom, comes responsibility and I dare not linger for my long walk is not ended. Goodbye our beloved Madiba. Sia bulela tata. God bless you. Anything could have happened that day he walked free from Victor Fester prison. What did happen, however, was a series of inspired human choices, which are still ours to make if we choose. Nelson Mandela had no regrets because what he did pleased his soul. His actions and his words remain a living legacy of his greatness and an inspiration to walk in his footsteps.